friends welcome to yet another webinar from mandala accounting and i welcome you all for today's webinar on gst tech updates and as i mentioned in every session it's our endeavor that we always enrich our knowledge by updating ourselves gst is one which changes time to time it gets changed and more importantly the view of the law the position of the law gets confirmed or annulled by certain important decisions and parallelly some circulars coming over that so every month we it's our duty to enrich our participants on what are the latest updates that are happening the second part of the session is on the technology updates today is the world of bots today is the world of performance speed and when we talk about speed whatever the work which is being done in 3 days is expected to be done in 3 minutes and we as a finance professionals we are no less that in use of computers we have to adopt to technology again it's our endeavor to upgrade and update all our members what are the things that we can do in view of that welcome you all to the 83rd gst update session with me i have my colleague ashika who will be taking taking on tax dispute resolution systems and hitesh talking on key clarifications that have been issued by web circulars or the amendments that are coming notifications on the tech part we i have delhi babu another colleague who will be talking on how to automate gst or to be as a purchase i will be there throughout the session feel free to interrupt interact by asking questions you are here to learn or get yourself clarified on various points request you to put your questions and get them solved with this note i hand it over to hitesh and ashika to begin the session thank you sir so friends we are here to discuss about the recent recommendations which have been made by the gst council in its 54th council meeting and in this session we will be discussing mainly upon the tax resolution uh, tax resolution disputes which we, which has been provided by the council and the key clarifications which has been issued by the gst council through issue of circulars on some very litigated subject matters in the gst let me present you my screen so friends the agenda for today's discussion is dispute the first topic which we will be discussing upon is dispute tax resolution the second is the second topic for today is the second topic which we will be discussing upon is the compliance related changes which has been recommended in the 54 gst council meeting then we will move on move on to the rate changes in the gst as proposed by the council and then we'll move on to certain clarifications on subject matters which are very litigative under gst to start out with let's start with dispute tax resolution friends as you all must be knowing that section 128a of the cgst act was actually introduced by the finance bill introduced in the finance bill the gst council has notified the date of 1st november 2024 as the date from which this section will become effective earlier the council had recommended that 31st march 
31st March 2025 would be the date whereby if all the taxes have been duly paid by the taxpayer, then full waiver of interest and penalty can be exercised by the taxpayer by virtue of this section. Now, in the 54th GST Council meeting, this date has been actually notified as 31st March 2025, whereby Section 128A, the provisions of Section 120, benefits of 128A can actually be exercised. For the implementation of this section, the Council has recommended an insertion of Rule 164 in the CGST rules. Now, coming to what actually Section 128A talks about. Friends, in the past one year, there have been various litigations. Many of you have received show cause notices. You have replied to them. The department has passed orders. Some of them have been in your favor. Some of them have been against you. So the government is actually introducing this section by virtue of which it is giving you a uh, benefit of getting a waiver of interest and penalty provided you have actually paid the tax demanded in full. Provided you have actually paid the tax demanded in full. So this section actually enables a taxpayer to avail the benefit of waiver of interest and penalty for the initial three financial years pertaining to financial year 1718, 1890 and 1920. If you have paid the tax in full, you can definitely go for waiver of interest and penalty. Now, what are the scenarios which are eligible for claiming benefit of Section 128A? Suppose a show cause notice has been issued to you under Section 73 for any of the financial year 1718, 1819 or 1920, but inter uh, and interest and penalty has been demanded in the show cause notice, but order in BRC 07 has not yet passed. This is the first scenario whereby you can actually avail the benefit of Section 128A. The second scenario is order has been passed in from DRC 07 for the show cause notice issued under Section 73 and we have also filed the appeal to that particular order which has been passed against you but the appellate order is pending as a date. And the third scenario is the appellate order has also been passed, but no appeal has been preferred as on date to GSTAT because GSTAT has not yet come into existence. What are the key points which we need to remember for 128A? The demand tax, which has actually been demanded either in the notice or the order appeal against, should have been paid in full. Now, to another important uh, recommendation made by the council with regard to this resolution is that persons who are desirous of availing the benefit of 128A will have to uh, withdraw all the litigations which are pending with the GST department. Now, what will be the procedures to withdraw all these litigations? In the minutes of the council meeting, it is written that the procedure will be Clarified soon. Another important outlook to this dispute resolution is they have very specifically mentioned in the section that this pertains to notices under section 73 or order passed under section 73.9. So, in case if any show cause notice is being issued under section 74, which is a fraud case and the same notice has been remanded back to the proper officer either by the High Court or any appellate authority for considering it under Section 73 and not under Section 74. So, when such cases take place, then your, you will be eligible to claim the benefit of Section 128A, which is waiver of interest and penalty provided the tax has been paid in full. 
Another important point to note here is in case there, there might be cases where order has been passed and in compliance to that order, we have already paid the tax, interest and penalty. So whether you will be getting a refund of those interest and penalty which has already been paid, very categorically in the section, it has been written that in no case, interest and penalty which has already been discussed will be refunded back. So as taxpayers, we always need to be aware of the remedies which are available to us and we need to keep on litigating with the department if the department is wrong at its end to pass any order against us. Because with so many recent changes, with so many ups and downs in the GST era, we are never very sure that what scheme the government will come up with so that we can save on our interest and penalty. If we comply with the order and we regret it later on that why did we pay the interest and penalty, there's no other option but to keep on with it. Uh, I want to add a point here for the benefit of members, what Hitesh has mentioned. Whenever you have a doubt or when there are two different views are available, then it is not certain whatever the view the department is propagating or the demand raised against you is certain. You always have a right to fight and I would suggest you should fight. Next, when in doubt and whenever you are paying tax interest penalty and you want to protest for the case, please do not pay interest and penalty. Pay off the tax because there is no concept of interest on interest for example interest for the year 70 tax for the year 1718 if it is paid in 22 23 you will end up paying interest for a period of 5 years however you have not paid the interest you only paid the tax interest assuming you are paying 5 more years later still the quantum of interest liability will only be five years. The interest meter will not further go up because the taxes have been paid. Point number one. Point number two, whenever you are making the payment of taxes, still utilize your opportunity to appeal against the order. So the taxes that you are paying, you would only be paying as a protest. In the erstwhile scenario, the concept of paying taxes under the protest exists while it is not there under GST. There are many experts who believe while making the payment under DRC 03, we mentioned that in the note section, we will mention this is paid under protest. In my view, that is not going to be defined as a protest. We also know that there is a judiciary, which is your tribunal, quasi-judiciary, and the high court, who can take the principles of natural justice, while the administrative body, which is the GST officers, JC commissioner, who work under the creature of the statute, who only go with the law book. In the law book, when there is no payment of pre-deposit as, as protest, there is actually nothing called protest. So you can pay while making the pre-deposit, which could be say 10%, uh, first appeal, 10%, second appeal. There is no restriction that you should only be paying 10%. You can pay even 100%. But still, it is made as a pre-deposit. You want to arrest the interest provision, right? So considering this in the mind, let me summarize two points. Point number one, when there is a doubt, do not do not get worried about the notices, fight for the notice and it can never be notice under section 74. It has to be under 73 because there is no fraud. Second, always pay the tax as pre-deposit 100% if you want to arrest the interest meter. Don't need to pay interest and penalty unless otherwise if it, it has become 
affirmatively confirmed numbers. These are the two points. Back to Hitesh. Thank you, sir. Now, although this is a very welcome move by the government of India through the recommendation of the council to introduce section 128A in the act, still there will be lot many queries in the minds of the normal tax space where, you know, there can be a numerous scenarios which will actually raise a doubt upon what will be the consequence of this. Some of the doubts which came to my mind was, which I'm sharing with you, is tax, interest and penalty paid in full before insertion of this section. Can refund of interest and penalty be claimed or waiver under this section be claimed? The answer to this is very clear now that no, because it has been categorically mentioned in the section itself that once paid, you cannot get back the interest and penalty. Tax and interest discharge, but penalty not paid. Can waiver of penalty and refund of interest be claimed? For yes, if tax and interest has already been discharged, then you cannot claim the refund of interest, but since you have already given it to the government, but since you have not paid the penalty, you can definitely go and apply for the waiver of penalty under 128A in the procedure which will be prescribed in the due course. Tax along with interest and penalty paid under protest and uh, refund application already filed. Ben can benefit of this section will be available? I don't think so. This section benefit will be available even if you uh, have paid under protest because as quoted by Venu sir rightly, there is no concept of protest. Even if you have paid under protest, the things with the tax and interest penalty, which whatever we have paid, already paid, now belongs to the government, no waiver, no refund. Can benefit of this section be claimed for notices under section 74? No. For section 74 cases, which come under the fraud, benefit of this section will not be available to uh, be claimed. Another important thing which we need to understand is that in case where erroneous refund has been given to you, this section is not applicable. It is applicable only in cases where notice under 73 has been given to you in case you have tax short paid, non paid or you have uh, means claim the ITC wrong uh, wrong availment of ITC, wrong utilization of ITC. For erroneous refund, this section is not applicable. Now, another very, two very important subsections have been added in section 16 of CGST Act, which is actually, you know, considered to be a crux of the GST, the input tax credit, in the field of input tax credit. In the 54th council meeting, although they have not notified the date as of now, when these two sections will be, uh, subsections will be applicable, will be effective, but they have, pro they have proposed to lay out a mechanism for claiming ITC under these two subsections. So we need to be very proper in our understanding of these two specific subsections, which talk about claiming of ITC. Now, section 16, subsection 5. This talks about providing relief to all the taxpayers whose credit was barred by limitation under section 16.4. 16.4 has been one of the biggest litigative topics in the field of GST in the past one year. In the initial years, there were a lot many filers who actually filed their GST returns belatedly. And accordingly, the department started issuing notices and disallowing the credits, saying that you have claimed this ITC in your return billeted, which is beyond the time limit prescribed under Section 16.4. The time limit, which is prescribed under 16.4, is currently 30th November of the year, subsequent to the year to which your invoice or debit note pertains, or date of filing annual return, whichever is 
16.5 has brought a bracket provision whereby the government is actually giving a relaxation saying that for the initial four financial years, 1718, 1819, 1920 and 2021, you can avail the credit and it will not be time barred provided you satisfy the two conditions. You must have claimed the credit in your GSTR 3B and secondly, you must have filed all your GSTR 3B returns pertaining to these financial years that is from July 2017 to March 2021 by 30th November 2021. If you have done so, then you are eligible for claiming input tax credit without ignoring the provisions of 16.4. Now, will this end all the litigation regarding this matter? In my opinion, still no, because they have very specifically mentioned in the section that you need to claim your ITC in GSTR 3D. There might be scenarios like you have not claimed your ITC in GSTR 3D, but you have actually claimed such ITC in your annual return of that particular financial year. There might be scenarios where you have not claimed your ITC in GSTR 3D, but ITC has been booked in your books of accounts. So, still they are considering 3D to be a valid document for claiming of return for claiming of ITC. Well, this is still not yet over, but a very big welcome step for all those taxpayers who have actually filed their returns within the date as prescribed in this subsection. Coming, moving ahead towards 16 subsection 6. 16 subsection 6, this subsection provides that in case your registration had got cancelled and due to which you could not file your GSTR 3D on time and your credit gets debarred for that purpose. Means your credit gets debarred because you could not file your GSTR 3D on time due to cancellation of registration. So in such cases, when your cancellation of registration has been revoked, then the government is giving you the opportunity to claim your ITC in two scenarios. One, if the time limit to claim ITC as per 16.4 for that particular financial year in which your registration got cancelled is still alive, you claim your ITC within such time period or if that time period has lapsed, then you need to actually file all your returns from the date of cancellation till the date of revocation from the within the period of 30 days from the date of revocation of your registration. If you do so, you are eligible to claim ITC under section 16, subsection 6 of the GST Act. Now, these some RCM clarifications have been issued in the council meeting. These clarifications actually relate to the import of service by branch office. They have actually exempted, they have actually suggested to exempt import of services by an establishment of foreign airlines company, company from a related person or any of its establishment outside India when made without consideration. This is one clarification which has been proposed. The second clarification is more relevant in normal day-to-day -day practice in the GST law, whereby renting of commercial property has actually been, when you actually avail the services of renting of commercial property from an unregistered person, then you being registered will now have to discharge the tax liability under reverse charge. Why has this been done? Because in the recommendations, it has been written to prevent the revenue leakage. 
you might be aware that recently, a few days back, similar type of provisions was also introduced for renting of residential property. The same has been done with in the cases of commercial property from now on. The recommendation has been made that renting of commercial property by a registered person from an unregistered person should also be coming under the purview of labor stance. Now, some, let us talk about some compliance related recommendations which were made in the 54th GST Council meeting. Well, the invoice management system, IMS. Well, all of us have been dealing with the problems of, you know, ITC reconciliation, ITC mismatch, and all those things over the years. It has been seven years since the GST has come into the picture. But still, this resolution, this problem was the burning problem in the GST. With IMS, they have actually given us a facility to, you know, to actually have that matching concept, which was actually envisaged in the original GST law, which was supposed to come from 1st July 2017, but it has now been introduced. So better late than never. What does this IMS facility say? With IMS, now the GCPM will be able to check the invoices which have been uploaded by their suppliers on their dashboard on a real-time basis. The recipient will have the options to either accept, to either reject, or to keep the invoices uploaded by the supplier as pending. Once the recipient exercises these options, the GSTR 2B of the recipient gets computed. Now, suppose in a let's take a scenario whereby the recipient has actually not performed any action till date, means uh, till 14th of the month. So, as it happens now, GSTR 2B of the recipient will be available on the portal by 14. But the only change which will take place is if any action which has been taken by the recipient prior to 14 on this IMS portal, that will get computed in computed and GSTR 2B will, draft it, will be drafted in that manner. Now, if the recipient takes any action post 14 of the month, then the recipient needs to be very sure that he has to recompute his GSTR 2B before proceeding to file GSTR 3B. Because if any action was not taken before the 14th of the month, then and actions were taken post 14, the 2B which will auto-populate is as per the 2B of the portal. There might be instances where you your GSTR 2B, which has been generated by the portal, is reflecting invoices, which is actually, you know, uh, the goods, the supply relating to those invoices has actually not been received by you, but they are reflecting in your GSTR 2B. So, as per the restrictions given in 16.2, you being the recipient, if you have not received the goods, you are not allowed to claim input tax credit. Thereby, with the Arrival of this IMS, you need to make sure that if you accept those, if you don't accept those invoices, then it will be a deemed acceptance. But if you identify those invoices pertaining to which supply has not been received as on date, you can just click on the button pending at your IMS dashboard, and that particular invoice will not go into your JSTR 2B. So, thereby, your compliance of reporting such temporary reversal in 4B2 and subsequently reporting in the subsequent months, table 4D1 of GSCR 3D, when you are actually claiming such ITC, will get reduced because you have exercised the pending option 
this doesn't get auto populated in a JCR 2B accordingly. There will be no need of any temporary reversal and weakening. So, all in all, this is a very welcome step by the council. This is a very welcome step which has been uh, suggested by the council, which has been implemented on the dashboard as well. It is available from 1st October 2024. And uh, like some new ledgers have been introduced whereby you are uh, you will be required to report the opening balances like rcm ledger and the uh, electronic reversal ledger many ledgers have been also introduced with this ims facility what this has done what this has done to you know means it is a very welcome step but with the in, uh, arrival of this ims the taxpayers need to make sure that they have one dedicated person who actually, you know, uh, particularly works in this field so as to avoid any uh, wrong reporting or any errors in at the time of filing their monthly returns. If this is controlled at the taxpayers end in a judicious way, I think the reconciliations will get even smoother the differences will become even less and uh, process will be more streamlined. Another proposal made by the GST Council is about the B2C e-invoice. Considering the success which the government of India has achieved in implementing the B2B e-invoicing phase-wise, where we started from 500 crores and today, the as per the last notification from 1st August 2023 has come down to 5 crores. The government is planning to implement B2C invoicing also. What will this do is that this will actually roll out a pilot. They will actually roll out a pilot for B2C invoicing in a phased manner in they will be certain industry specific and they will plan it out in a phased manner. They will actually ask, uh, they will actually have a team who would suggest them in the manner and the process of implementation of this B2C invoicing. So for all the taxpayers, it is very important to be very aware that B2C invoicing, when it becomes applicable, whether be it industry specific or in general sense, it's the days are not very far. So, we need to be aware of this situation as well. Now, coming to the topic of GST rate changes. The GST, some of the GST rate changes have been prescribed by the GST Council or recommended by the GST Council in the 54 Council meeting. The first one is the description of the product is numkins and extruded or expanded savory food products which come under the HSM code 19059030. The before amendment, the rate was 18%, but after amendment, the rate has been shifted to 12%. Some of the specific cancer drugs which has been, uh, you know, which is used for cancer treatment treatment of patients suffering from cancer. The government has relaxed the, revised the GST rates from 12% to 5%. With regard to metal slabs, again, this is a very big amendment, big amendment proposed by the GST Council. They are planning to introduce RCM on metal slabs purchased from unregistered dealer. If a registered dealer is purchasing RCM from an unregistered dealer, then RCM would be applicable on purchase of such metal slabs. Another important amendment in this amendment proposed in the purchase of metal slab is that in case it is a P2B supply, a registered person is selling metal slab to another registered person, then they have introduced the provisions of TDS as well in GST at the rate of 2%. So now they have, they, in future, they will actually be clarifying more on this particular topic. 
how this CDS would be applicable, whether this CDS would be applicable only when supply is being made to the government department or other cases, clarifications will be coming in the near future. For roof mounted package units, which comes under the HSN code 8415, it, uh, it has the GST rate has been proposed to be 28%. The car seats, when you actually purchase car seats um, for your passenger vehicles, that has to be classified under HSN 9401. And before amendment, the rate for this uh, particular product was 18%. Now it is being increased to 28%. The recommended the recommendations of the council they have said that to bring parity between the rates of car and motorbikes seat covers they have done this because the motorbike seat covers were already being taxed at twenty eight percent as on date. Okay, just be there. Uh, so, a couple of points I would like to highlight when uh, these rate changes happen. And uh, the circulars which are issued recently, these circular also have to be analyzed carefully whenever the rate change has been discussed. I'll pick one example that we have looked at, which is uh, Namkeen. For Namkeen, this rate has been made, if you see on the screen, that Earlier it was 18%, now 12%. But what exactly is the rate? And restaurant industry has always been in dispute for various reasons, for various aspects. It was 5%. It was 5% if the food is served. Now imagine a savory product which is prepared in the restaurant and served is going to be at 5% and not 18 or 12%. And this notification when it was issued and the 53rd council meeting also said that these changes are made on as is various basis. Now, when we say as is various basis, we also have to be very, 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 very categorically look at whenever there is as is various. Because certain cases, they have given an exemption for the past whatever which is there and made a clarification saying that the rate of tax is so and so. In some cases, to regularize, they have given an as is various basis. Question is, if in the past I have paid 5%, now the department is saying that okay it is 12 percent while earlier i have paid 18 percent and now department is saying pay 12 percent we have taken two scenarios earlier i have paid five percent now the rate of tax has become 12 percent earlier i have paid 18 percent now the rate has become at 12 percent from 18 to 12 or 5 to 12 because the recommendation is as is various basis. Whenever there is an as is various basis, the question that comes is, will my past will be regularized? First scenario that 18% I have paid earlier, 12% now, can I take a refund of it? Answer is no. No refund, whatever you have done is good. Let's take the earlier scenario, the other scenario where it was 5%, and now it is asked to pay 12%. Will the department come and demand the differential 7%? And let's take a basic scenario that I have not collected from the customer. I have collected only 5% from the customer. Will the department ask 7% uh, from me from the for the Namkin products? Again, Namkin, the dispute will still continue. Which Namkin is 5% and which Namkin? Because which is the restaurant? If, if uh, 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 the popularly known uh, all the sav uh, the savories those which is pre-packed and coming eligible for redistribution that is what is being actually classified here in the under the chapter 19 so someone who have treated this as 
food product exempt in the past and has not paid any tax. I'm bringing the third one. Will the as is basis continue and expand that is another Pandora box that one has to look at it. It may appear to you plain simple, ha, ye to rate change, 18 set 12 ho gaya, that's, uh, it's okay. But you also have to see if you fit into any of these categories, what you are seeing on the screen, it is not as simple as you think about the change uh, as is where is business. We have to see, especially cases where a show cause notice has been issued and a demand has been confirmed. In that cases, chances of the demand continuing will be there. The demand will not be dropped. The demand continuing would be there. You, it would be a legal fight that you have to say that this exemption is to regularize the past thing. This exemption is to not to clarify the rate uh, from this to this, but it is to regularize what is so. Clear? Please proceed. If you have any doubts, put it in the chat box. Now let us discuss about some recommendations with regard to services, which has been you know, uh, recommended in the GST Council for life and health insurance. Uh, there has been a lot of dispute regarding the applicability of uh, GST on life and health insurance from the opposition leaders as well. So the GST Council has recommended to constitute a group of ministers to holistically look into the matter of the applicability of GST on life and health insurance. And as far as we know, like uh, the these group of ministers are liable to submit a detailed report to the council by the end of October. Transportation of passengers by helicopters. The council has recommended to notify GST at the rate of 5% for transportation of passengers by helicopter on sharing basis on as is where is basis. This as is where is basis is very important as quoted by sir. To also clarify, the charter of the helicopter will still be continued to be taxed at 18% per annum. The flying training courses, some flying training courses which are being provided by TGCA uh, approved flying training organizations are exempt from the levy of GST. Such flying training courses are exempt from GST. Yeah, here in the previous slide. Yes, sir. Uh, when the transportation of passengers by helicopter is at 5%, this is on a seat share basis. So generally, when we when we fly uh, in the regular aeroplane, we buy the seat and go. However, when it comes to helicopters, helicopters are generally or charter flights, they have been, they hide full per se. But if you notice in pilgrimage places like Vaishnavi Devi and other high altitude places, the helicopters are hired on a seat share basis. So that means these helicopters are done to a transportation of passenger because you're traveling by helicopter, it is maybe considered as a luxury and it should at, attract 18%. While the, we all know the uh, tour operation services and which are other at 5%. So this was a dispute which was going to put rest to the problem. They brought in the word seat share basis. Again, this is as is, where is basis. So there are uh, different agencies who have adopted uh, different things. So uh, those who have claimed exemption under pilgrim, I am not going to discuss, we can have a separate session for them, but if you, any one of you fit in their as is basis and you have treated some of your services as exempt, you can, uh, there is a still a chance to fight under as is where is basis. Continue. Supply research and development services. Now with pertaining to this entry, 
the government actually has recommended me i mean the gst council has actually recommended to exempt supply of services of research and development services by a government entity or a research association university or college notified under sub sub clause 2 or sub clause 3 of subsection 1 of section 35 of the income tax act using government or private grants even if the fund which are being used by a institution which is registered under 351 or notified under 351 352 351 sub clause 2 or 351 sub clause 3 even the funds are being used through which have been received privately by those institutions for research and development services then also this will be exempt from gst the other important changes preferential location charges the plc which we see in the real estate sector to clarify that location charges or plc paid along with consideration for construction services of residential industrial commercial complex before issuance of cc shall form part of composite supply whereby supply of construction services is the main service and plc is naturally bundled and is eligible for the same tax treatment as the main supply of the construction service so plc has been recommended to be treated as a composite supply in case with the construction service being the principal supply affiliation services now like affiliation when these affiliation services are actually being provided by educational boards like cbsc these are taxable however to exempt affiliation services provided by state or central educational boards educational councils and other similarly placed bodies to government schools prospectively if these affiliation services as are being provided to any government school the council has recommended to exempt the same to clarify by way of circular that affiliation services provided by universities to constituent colleges are not covered within the ambit of exemption provided to educational institution with by virtue of notification number 12 by 2020 central tax rate dated 28 june 2017 and the gst rate applicable on such affiliation services provided by the universities to respective colleges will be 18% many universities were of the opinion that such affiliation services are exempt by way of by virtue of notification number 12 by 2017 central tax rate but that is not the case which has been clarified by the council in its 54th council meeting now coming on to the next topic some recent clarifications which has been issued by the gst council which was made by the gst council by way of recommendation in its 54th council meeting and some circulars have been issued by the cbic with respect to such clarifications the first one is pertaining to a very very litigated matter in the field of gst which pertains to demo vehicles whether clarification of clarification on availability of itc of demo vehicles the questions which are covered by this clarification which has been issued through circular number 231 bar 2024 where availability of itc on demo vehicles used for transportation of passengers with seating capacity of not more than 13 persons including the driver and the second question which was raised availability of itc on demo vehicles in cases where such vehicles are capitalized in the books of account now first we should understand demo vehicles where does this concept come from 
every time we go to purchase a new car, there would hardly be any person who would actually not ask for a test drive or a demo drive. So for the purpose of providing these test drive services, the authorized dealers, they actually purchase demo vehicles from the manufacturer or the distributor. Suppose you go to a Maruti Suzuki authorized dealer and you want to buy a new car. You want to take a test drive. The car which is which they will provide you for test drive, whether on such purchase or such car, ITC will be available. That was the doubt. That was the litigative matter. Okay. So by virtue of this circular, they have actually tried to clarify these doubts. Now, looking at the general provisions in the GST law, we all know that for motor vehicles, for use for transportation of passengers, where the seating capacity is not more than 13 persons, including the driver, the ITC is blocked on such motor vehicles. Only three scenarios have been prescribed whereby you are actually allowed to, you know, claim ITC on such motor vehicles, where you are actually claiming that ITC for further supplying the due course of the business or you are imparting training to such, imparting for the, you are claiming, you are purchasing such motor vehicle for imparting training. Means driving schools, if they purchase these motor vehicles, they will very well be eligible for ITC. Let me share, open the clarification, which the, uh, which was actually issued by the CBIs for you to be more clear on the subject matter. Uh, your screen of the circular is not coming up. Yes, sir. I'm sharing it. First. Okay. As you can see, this is the circular which has been issued by the CBIC for clarifying whether ITC is available on demo vehicles. The first aspect which we took is like 17.5 blocks the credit, except when they are used for making the following taxable supplies. Further supply of such motor vehicles, transportation of passengers, or imparting or training on driving such motor vehicles. Here, they are the intention. They are saying that the intention of the law is not actually to disallow the credit on demo vehicles. Had there been the intention of the law, then they would have not used the word such in clause A of the exceptions where the input tax credit has not been blocked. They would have used the word safe motor vehicles. Since they have used the word such motor vehicles, so this actually broadens the viewpoint from where the ITC can actually be treated to be not blocked in nature. Now, if such demo vehicles are being kept by the authorized dealers, they are definitely not meant for the transportation of passengers. They are only meant for test drives. So, clause B of the exception from block credit list gets eliminated. It is also not for imparting training to the uh, uh, potential customers 
because and that's why clause C of the exception list also gets eliminated. Now, these demo vehicles, they actually come under further supply of such motor vehicles as has been clarified under the circular. If we give this para, we can definitely look into the matter with a clear idea. Regarding the provision of blockage for input tax credit in respect of motor vehicles for transportation of persons having approved sitting capacity of not more than 13 persons, including the driver, the usage of the words such motor vehicles instead of the word said motor vehicles in the subclause A of clause A of section 17, subsection 5 implies that the intention of lawmaker is was not only to exclude from the blockage of input tax credit the motor vehicle which is itself further supplied, but also to exclude from blockage of input tax credit all similar motor vehicles. As demo vehicles are used by authorized dealers to provide trial run to demonstrate features of the vehicle to potential buyers, it helps the potential buyers to make a decision to purchase a particular kind of motor vehicle. Therefore, as demo vehicles promote sale of similar type of motor vehicles, they can be considered to be used by the dealer for making further supply of such motor vehicles. Accordingly, input tax credit in respect of demo vehicles is not blocked. Now comes the second scenario. Suppose you have a demo vehicle, but using the demo vehicle, the authorized dealer is actually providing transportation of passenger services to his own employees or the staff who is working there. In such cases, the circular has very clearly clarified that ITC will not be available. Now, there comes a third scenario where you actually see that the authorized dealer is actually acting only as an agent between the manufacturer and the end customer. The actual bill, in case of an actual sale, the bill will be raised directly by the manufacturer to the end customer and the uh, authorized dealer has acted only as an agent or has only facilitated to uh, make the sale possible. Even in such cases, if that is the scenario, then you will not be able to claim ITC on demo vehicles, even as an authorized dealer. The second question, which was actually raised in the council in the uh, for clarification in front of the GST council was whether ITC on such demo vehicles will be available if these vehicles are capitalized in the books of accounts of the authorized dealer. Now, to answer this query, the GST Council took a very broad approach whereby they have said that 16.1 enables, which is an enabling provision, it gives the right to every registered person to claim input tax credit. On secondly, they define goods, which has been defined as in the GST Act as per 2 subsection 52. Further, they also define section 2 subsection 19 capital goods, which has been defined in 2 subsection 19 of CGSCA. If we go through the definition of capital goods, capital goods definition says that capital goods means goods, the value of which is capitalized in the books of accounts of the person claiming the input tax credit and which are used or intended to be used in the course of furtherance of business. So what really is important is whether that capitalized goods is being used or intended to be used in the course of furtherance of business. Capitalization or non-capitalization in the books of accounts will not actually impact the eligibility of ITC in the hands of authorized dealer. Yes, one thing which needs to be noted is that when authorized dealer has actually capitalized it in his books of accounts, we have to cross check whether he has capitalized in the full value, if he has capitalized in the full value, including GST, on which he is claiming depreciation under Section 32 of Income Tax Act, then 
he will not be eligible for ITC under 16 subsection 3, which is again a restrictive provision. In case the authorized dealer has not capitalized the uh, demo vehicle in his books of accounts at full value, he has capitalized it only on the taxable value, then he is definitely eligible to claim ITC on such demo vehicle provided that is used in the course of furtherance of his business. When such demo vehicle will be sold, then will GST be applicable on sale of such demo vehicle? Definitely it will be applicable. And for the computation of GST on the sale of such demo vehicle, we need to go to the provisions of section 18.6, they read with rule 44 of CGST rules, which gives us the manner for calculating the GST payable on, on sale of such demo vehicles. Coming back to the PPT, where I was actually showing you, I have created some scenarios which actually would give you a better understanding of the circular We have created certain scenarios whereby the demo vehicle, when it is capitalized and is sold after demo, it is eligible for ITC. When it is capitalized and it is used for internal use, which means it is being used, although it has been capitalized in the books of accounts, but it is being used for transportation of their own employees and other stuff, then ITC will not be available. In case the demo vehicle has not been capitalized in the books of accounts and it is being sold after demo, then also ITC is available. The third scenario comes whereby the authorized dealer is acting only as an agent, whereby he is not even issuing an invoice for the final sale and the invoice for the final sale is also being issued by the manufacturer or the distributor and the authorized dealer only acts a facilitator to make this sale to the end customer, then in such cases, ITC will not be available. Coming back to moving ahead, we go to the next clarification on refund, which is clarification, which is clarification on refund of IGST away in contravention of Rule 96, Sub Rule 10 of CGST Rules 2017. To understand this, we need to have a very brief outlook of what this actually pertains to. This is actually pertaining, we need to understand, we need to have a backdrop of the scenario which led to this clarification. Earlier, there was a scheme, means there is a scheme like called advanced authorization, whereby the exporters can actually avail the benefit of advanced authorization and thereby can input can import the import uh, can import the inputs required for manufacture and export of goods without payment of IGST and compensation says on such imports. For this advance authorization, the exporter had to apply to the DGFT and if the DGFT approved it, Director General of Foreign Trade, if the DGFT approved it, then the exporter could have availed the benefit of advance authorization under the notification number 78 bar 2017 and 79 bar 2017 customs and he could have imported such inputs without paying any GST or compensation sets, compensation sets on such imports. Now, what actually happened before this clarification, the exporters, they actually avail the benefit of advanced authorization as well. And they actually claimed refund of IGST, which they have paid on ex such exports made. So thereby, they actually got the benefit twice. 
Rule 96 sub rule 10 actually quotes that in case you have availed the benefit of advance authorization, you cannot avail the benefit of refund of IGST paid on exports. So this was the scenario before recommendation. Import imported without payment of IGST and compensation says an export of goods used in manufacture and export of goods, then you will not be allowed to claim refund on IGST paid on exports. But there have been scenarios where the exporter has actually availed both the benefits, advanced authorization plus refund of IGST paid on exports. However, when the department actually became aware of such scenario, which is being taking place throughout the country, the department actually started sending show cause notices through scrutiny inspection, uh, through scrutiny, through audit. The department find out, found out that people are actually exploiting the benefits which have been given to them to promote and facilitate trade. So there were many circumstances whereby the, uh, the department has actually levied the IGST and compensation says on whereby the department has actually levied IGST and compensation says on such imports. So now the circular, now the clarification which has come from the GST council and the CBIC has issued a circular on the matter is that even in case you have imported your inputs without payment of IGC and compensation shares, thereby claiming the benefit of advance authorization as was available to you. And later on, at any stage, the jurisdictional customs officer has actually reassessed your original bill of entry and you have duly paid your IGC and compensation shares on such inputs along with applicable interest which was which you were which you were liable to pay then in such cases the refund which you have claimed on payment of IGST for exporting the goods shall not be deemed to be in contravention of rule 96 sub rule 10 of CGST rules this is the clarification which has come from the CBIC they are saying okay you have avail both the benefits, but in case you have discharged the applicable the IGC and compensation says to the customs department along with applicable interest, then you are not at default, you will not be deemed to be a default and the refund which has been paid to you uh, for exporting the goods with payment of tax will not be deemed to be in contravention of Rule 96, sub rule 10 of CGST rules 2017. Yeah, I would like to add a small point here for the benefit of members exporters. 9610 has been under the, in discussion for a quite a while. And whenever the goods are exported from India to a place outside India, all the exporters had these two benefits either uh, use a rebate method, I mean, or use input tax credit refund or you pay applicable output tax using the input tax credit or the tax and claim the refund of the taxes paid. These both were available. 9610 originally said these goods have been imported into India under some advance authorization or some benefit. Hence, you cannot claim a refund on exports of this. This rule has come in. This came in between and many exporters unaware and with the, without the knowledge have done the exports with payment of tax and claim the refund of tax. The question that the matter went to many high courts, the question is, this is revenue neutral. There hasn't been any violation. If the refund was not claimed, the input tax credit ledger of the exporter would have had this balance otherwise. How, having paid, how do we regularize? And in many cases, the department asked to return the refund taken along with the interest. And it used to be a big working capital block. 
for many exporters. This was not even a viable thing because the advance authorization benefit is only to some ex some imports. Let's say out of 100 rupees export which is done, we will keep 10 rupees as the profit margin. So that means on the 10 rupees, whatever is the refund they have claimed has got nothing to do with the import. Next, out of 90, the manufacture process generally, 40% is material, rest is the labor value addition. On the labor value addition, which is the domestic procurement, then let's say on the 40, the material which has been purchased, the material that has been purchased, which has both some local material that has been also purchased. So by foregoing advance authorization benefit, paying IGST on imports would be more beneficial for them to go ahead and claim the refund of it. And there have been a lot of representations that have been made saying that in case if the department wants to disallow 9610, there were some domestic procurements, there is a value addition, which has got nothing to do with the advance authorization benefit that they have taken. So to put rest to the problem, they have given a simple solution. You reassess your bill of entry, pay the appropriate IGST on imports and assess wherever is applicable. So you are not claiming the benefit and you are not under 9610. So the question of claiming refund will not come. A uh, question of returning the refund claimed will not arise. DG, uh, DGFT and DGJ in many cases, huge amounts have been caught and many problems are put into. Please proceed. Yes, sir. To next. So now two more class clarification has been come. One is in relation to advertisement service and one is relating to data uh, data hosting service. So first dealing with advertisement service. Now over here, this clarification basically relates to where a foreign client, a person located outside India has engaged an advertisement agency in India. So this clarification is specifically for those transactions. So where the foreign client has engaged the service of advertisement agency in India. Now the question which arises, how the taxability and place of supply will operate over here. So the first thing which they have clarified in this is what is the work which has been given by foreign client to Indian advertising agency. So they are saying when the foreign client is giving a comprehensive work, even the work comprehensive they are saying means full-fledged what is need to be done in relation to an advertisement has been given to an advertisement agency under such circumstances how we have to check the place of supply. They define what will be the comprehensive agreement also which include ranging from media planning, investment planning, creating and designing the content, identification of media owner, broadcasting, printing of advertisement, including monitoring of the progress, and even where that advertisement to be displayed, and which media owner it need to be choose, that all is a total part of the work assigned to Indian advertisement agency. So over here, they are saying we need to check whether the agreement is on principle to principle basis, or advertisement agency is working as an agent. So in circular, they have clarified if it is on principle to principle basis, like where a comprehensive agreement has been entered, where agency is responsible to make sure all the things which is required for advertisement. In such a circumstance, he is working on a principle to principle basis. He is not working as an agent because overall work has been given. Now to get that work done, he might be taking the support of another service providers. But by taking the support of another service provider, it doesn't mean he is working as an agent. The first distinguishment and the first clarification they have brought is if they are working on a principle to principle basis, it will not fall under intermediary service. Now, as intermediary service, we know that it is the person who worked or act on behalf of an another person. And in case of intermediary service, as per place of supply, 
it is a location of the service provider so if advertisement agency fall under intermediary then it will become india as a place of service and therefore it will become taxable but they have clarified as it is working as a principal to principal basis then it will fall under a default rule by falling our default rule under 132 place of supply will become where my foreign client is located but obviously whether it will qualify as export or not that will be based on all the condition of export of service has been fulfilled so this relate to first part now another clarification in relation to this advertisement agency they have provided is there may be a case even though it is work has been given by foreign client it has been done by foreign client that foreign client may have somebody who is representing in India. So whether if there is any person who is representing in India and even audience is of India, whether it can be said that taxability will fall under India. So they have said that if agreement is with foreign client, payment is received from foreign client, even though my targeted audience is in India, it will not mat matter. My place of supply will still be under default rule. That is the location of the recipient. And accordingly, it will fall outside India. Another issue which arise was clarification, which was sought for performance-based service. Now, when we heard the word performance-based service, in this like intermediary, it is a place of supply is your location of service provider. When it comes to performance base, then place of supply has been defined where the service is actually performed or where a person is required to be physically present in order to provide the service. Now, if we see the advertisement in, uh, industry, there is no need for physical presence of the service recipient, means the ultimate customer. I'm not talking about foreign client, targeted audience. There is no need to be physically there in order to provide the service. So therefore, it will also not fall under performance base. So one by one, they said, as it will not fall under intermediary performance base, therefore, it will fall under default rule. And accordingly, place of supply will be outside India. That is what the clarification they have issued for advertisement service, but with the one disclaimer that it should be principle to principle. However, if it is on agent basis, then it will fall under intermediary service and place of supply will become India. So this is all in relation to advertisement service. Now, moving on to next one. No, I Data would like questions. to add a small point here. Okay. Uh, so in the advertising services, uh, this clarification is important. Look at from other industries who are into export of services. The last point which Ashika was mentioning on the performance-based services, this question generally comes to many people. I am here in India providing some service. Will it will the place of supply be outside India? Will it be treated as export of services because I'm providing the service here? See, export of services doesn't necessarily mean that you have to travel outside India and provide a service to someone. Like when I'm doing say bookkeeping, I have purchased a tally license. Someone sends me uh, in uh, Google Drive or Dropbox some documents. I just do data entry in the system here, which is there in my office land. Will it be export? The answer is it is export. The recipient is outside. He is the one who is getting the benefit of my work. Though the work is being done here, it would qualify as export. In an advertisement, and especially this issue has been picked up by a lot of media houses, who buy a lot of media and in advertisement we know biggest spend that happens is on SEM. SEO is more organic and it is a professional fees. While SEM is consumed by Facebook, LinkedIn and the Google AdWords, they, they, they run into huge lags. Here, the media agency month over month basis their bill which they are receiving from the Google they recover it back from the foreign client. So the doubts were raised by the officer saying that since you are facilitating in the bill, you clearly know from the, uh, the cost categorization that this is so, so and so, so and so client or so and so add everything. So why should I not treat this as an intermediary services? Here, the circular said, in case 
and by the way it is always a tri party argument so google or anyone knows that uh, advertisement is placed by for samsung by xyz media house so even this uh, tri party agreements sometimes exist even though all this happen if the the media is purchased by the media house let's say samsung gives them a budget okay go ahead and spend 25 lakhs every month on google so these these agency will choose what keyword where i should place all those things the transaction here is principle to principle there is only one situation where it is an intermediary where the indian agency is acting as a agent of the principal which is say let's say samsung saying that they are negotiating the deal and facilitating so that google directly bills to samsung for which the indian agency is billing a commission when such commission is being billed that commission will not qualify as an export it would be an intermediary and the place of supply will be as per section 138 b it will not go to the regular route of 133 so the place of supply would be location of supplier which is in india leaving that all the ad, ad agency services not to be treated as intermediary again this circular has put rest to many notices that have come into the ad agency industry please go ahead now second clarification which has been issued is about data hosting service so over here they have clarify about the transaction between data hosting service to the cloud computing service provider now over here what happened is this data hosting services which they when they are providing they are making sure that data is properly collected stored processed distributed and they allow access to a large amount of data to the which is basically of cloud computing service provider now to provide this service data hosting service provider have a huge infrastructure they have their own software hardware their own properties it may be own or lease so they are using their own facility in order to provide this service now the question which arise again over here is like whether the same will qualify as a intermediary service if you will notice both the clarification is more on place of supply this one is again on place of supply only the first clarification which was sought is whether again this one will be a intermediary service or whether it will also fall as a performance based service or in this case one more clarification was sought is whether it is in relation to immovable property therefore place of supply like i said intermediary location of service provider performance based where the service is performed then immovable property it became location of a immovable property so why all this has been sought because place of supply is important from the point of view because it determine whether the taxability falls within india or not because unless and until the transaction falls within an india gst cannot be determined so place of supply plays a very important role so accordingly in this also they disperse said that again there is a principal to principal basis transaction over here data hosting service provider doesn't know who are their customers and they are not facilitating the customer of cloud computing so again like we discuss in the advertisement services where we explain how it will be principal to principal and agent so here they have classified that it is a principal to principal service provider and therefore it will not fall under intermediary coming to the second part whether it will be a performance based service or not that also they have clarified it cannot be because over here also all this property which has been used though it's relate to data service provider but nothing is been made available to recipient means recipient is not required to be present in order to avail avail the services therefore it will also not be a performance based though the property from where the service has been provided is in india though there is an infrastructure over here but it is not in relation to immovable property service providing therefore it will also not be regarded as immovable property related services 
again here it is falling under a default rule and therefore again it will become a location of the service recipient and based on will it will be decided whether it will fall under export or not or if it is within india then taxability will be determined based on igst cgst and sgst so this were the two clarification further uh, uh, for add some points to data hosting service because uh, uh, this is come indian scenario also and take this circular in light with uh, any other services where goods are to be made available and simple example could be job work you send the goods from your place to the job worker and job worker is doing some work on it and sending it back we know section 19 where they have given one year to return now you might be wondering how data hosting services are linked to it what typically happens in a data hosting take the case of ad take the case of aws take the case of uh, microsoft azure they provide infra there are other data centers which have specifically the space and they facilitate like a private cloud so i can take my server place it into their environment and i connect so the data hosting service provider do not charge me for the infra because infra is given by me so the multiple questions uh, that have come up first and foremost fundamental is it export is it an intermediary is it an export again just because the uh, hosting services are in india so it you cannot really say that it is not export it would still be export isn't it an immovable property a data center is used to host the infrastructure but if you notice you are not providing a rental services so it is not an entry pertaining to 134 and it is an entry pertaining to 133 itself 132 itself the regular it would be an export of services so they have given various scenarios and they have analyzed this so i request people who are doing any services on others goods job work where the classification comes into a picture you have to look at what is that actually you are providing are you providing infra are you providing a service using infra both are two different now renting of a server doesn't necessarily means that you are giving an immovable property so this is a fundamental distinguish distinction that one has to do right so these are the various points on the data hosting services back to you ashika i have to take any questions that are there yes so before we conclude our first part of gst session like hitesh in the starting of it discuss about section 128a waiver of interest and penalty so now as we are standing in september 2024 until 1920 all the audit scrutiny investigation is almost ended maybe under 73 or maybe under 74 though 128 is specifically for 73 cases now why i am saying is as you have as you all are attending our session on a regular basis there are multiple trade related in order to reduce litigation multiple benefit or multiple relief measure dst council has recommended from time to time which will avoid which will allow us to reduce litigation like 165 164 undertaking then as is where is basis regularized so it's very important just because one section has come with an amnesty scheme we should not jump to the conclusion let's pay the taxes and close it we should also check where are we standing today based on the various recommendation changes clarification which has been brought in so the first thing you should do is you should track down all your litigations all your notices audit whichever state it is download check 
where are at those stage means it is appeal stage notice stage or second appeal you are going to go for tribunal whatever may be the situation then what is the issue involved and the issue which has been involved is anything which has come as a clarification which has go went into your favor that also need to be verified before jumping for that waiver section 128a because if something has come even though amount may be small but if you are not required to pay the tax based on clarification issue then you can take that benefit instead of paying the tax one second by opting for 128a for one year it doesn't mean you have accepted the fact you are liable to pay tax for subsequent year one scheme coming into picture doesn't means acceptance if you have applied for it so if you are thinking whether i should go or not because issue is recurring nature in uh, one year it may be very small amount so you don't want to go for dispute you want to pay it and close you are very much welcome you can do that by opting for a scheme you are not accepting that you are liable to pay the tax okay there is one question in the chat on the marketing office uh, arvind then uh, see in your you are only talking about a marketing office or representation liaison office uh will it be a principal to principal or an agent to principal see when a marketing office has been set up to facilitate the marketing the product the marketing of a product cannot be an intermediary because a sale itself has not happened product promotion is happening so to qualify as an intermediary one has to be in between a transaction so that is something i want you to look into and those transactions would still fall under intermediary any other questions anyone all right Ashika, is there anything else before we move to tech uh, for pizza? Uh, no, sir. Nothing else. Okay. Great. Uh, let's move to the second part of today's session, which is on the technology. And uh, uh, today's topic is how do I integrate GSTR 2B data as a purchase? into tally now i am talking from the tally perspective it could be any other uh, thing as a practical it could be any software okay uh, i request delhi babu to yeah he's joined okay welcome he would be taking the session and uh, let's look at what is that uh, we are going to do let me just share my screen Now, first and foremost, I am talking about GSTR 2B. GSTR 2B is my purchase register. So I am accounting GSTR 2B as my purchases in tally. And uh, let me bring one. Okay, let me first, I'm sure everyone knows how to download a purchase register. So for the ease of it, I am explaining how a purchase register can be downloaded. So let me log in and uh, so you can go to your services, returns, returns dashboard and uh, let me pick 2023-24. April, May, June, whatever. So you can look at GSTR 2B, you have download. Hit the download button. You can download an Excel file, you can download a JSON file. The people, JSON is generally fast. So let me hit the download JSON file. So here is my returns data that has come. Now, for a normal man, let 
let me share the JSON, how it looks like. This is the JSON file. So for a normal man, it like it is uh, completely Greek and Latin. It talks about the different terminologies. However, it is all like from Ocean Inc. I have made some purchase or uh, some in auditors I have made a purchase, some purchase about the Airtel. So I have made a different purchases. And if there is IRN, it gives me the IRN number, whether it is a regular invoice or not, forward charge or reverse charge. All those information is submerged and available in this one document. Technically, it is my purchase. So for many people, uh, these are the regular expenditure, which you have to book as an expenditure. Like it might have to go to telephone charges and everything. So what we have thought is given that eventually GSTR 2B data is going to be an authentic information. Think of a scenario, there is a distributor who is uh, buying goods from the manufacturer and uh, selling to various retailers. Or imagine a retailer who is buying from different distributors and selling to the end customer. So wherever you think your purchases, 99% are digital transaction driven and uh, happening through bank and technology. It is better you rely on the purchase register, which is already available. You can book the purchases. So when you're booking this purchase, when this as an entry into tally, let me just open one tally. When you are uh, booking this as an entry into tally or rather than opening tally, let me put what are the challenges that we will be having. Yeah, white board. Hope the screen is visible to all. Yes. So if your 2B is the valid uh, purchase register, and this has to be posted into tally as your expenditure. It could be tally for some of you, SAP, Oracle, ERP, whatever uh, be it, it has to be posted as an expenditure there. The questions that needs to be answered, this is a blank canvas. This is blank, there's nothing. So first and foremost, I need to control or avoid errors. What's the first error? Whether the 2B, whether this 2B is pertaining to same tally or not. That means I need to do a GSTN validation or verification saying because if you notice in my in the earlier json which i have seen it is all purchase the bharti airtel purchase could be applicable to me or could be applicable to anyone so erroneously i should not post someone's J json data to some other i need to control that perfect the second thing that that comes up is okay you are controlling it so what is the second thing the second thing is my tally is blank. That means I need to create my ledgers. I need to create my ledgers. Three types of ledgers. What are the three types of ledgers? One, expenditure ledgers, capital or revenue, vendor master, and your tax ledgers. And tax ledgers could be you can create it manually one time. But vendor ledgers are incremental. Every time a new JSON, new vendor would come. Expense ledgers would also be incremental. Every time one new thing will come. What you are seeing in the JSON file is Bharti Airtel. You are not seeing it as telephone charges. So you should also have a placeholder wherein you will be able to do a marry and map these vendor and expenditure. You should be able to marry and map 
this vendor and the expenditure. So that is something that you will have to uh, be handling it, right? The third completion of the, uh, the third thing is posting of the transaction, which is transaction posting. How do we post the transaction is something that we have automated. So whole of this, what you are seeing on the screen is automated. And once this journey is automated, that imagine the quantum of the time that gets saved to the user. We will explain this step by step. So I've shown you how to download the JSON file. So leaving that portion, we will take up everything fresh from a blank tally. We will start up uh, with this without where there are no vouchers, nothing. We will start with that. Uh, Babu, over to you. Any questions to anyone so far? No problem. Continue. Thank you, sir. I think you explained very well with uh, flow and also controls and checks. It's very nice. Sir. Yeah. This is completely blank tally as uh, Sar explained. You see, there is no transactions. Yeah, this is statistics. If you see here, there is no transactions from just see, from 20 onwards, I'm just saying there is no transactions. There are some default groups and ledges. As Venusa said, this is one time duties and taxes has to be created. I just created to save time. CGST, if you want to create with percentage wise, you can create percentage wise. Otherwise, single ledger, CGST, IGST, SGST, that based on your requirement, you can create that uh, duties and taxes ledgers. Then also I created one standard ledgers. Suppose if you want to post standard uh, ledgers to uh, your expenses, you can post to standard ledgers. I just created this kind of standard ledgers. This also is not required. Okay, other than this, there is no other standard ledgers in tally. So right now, if you see there are groups are there, there is no other ledgers. If I go to ledger view. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see only this much is there. Yes, this is just standard ledgers. That has nothing. So we, we are starting with a blank canvas. Yeah, okay. Number one, there is a add-on. It's a tally add-on. Once we load this, okay, I'll show you that one also from help, TDLs and add-ons, manage local TDLs. Here you can load your uh, TCP. Once you load, this complete process can be automated. After this, there is a standard configuration uh, from F6. If you click F6 here, Add-on features. About whenever an add-on is added, how do you want the functionality of it? Do you want to activate it? Yes. If you set it as if those TCPs requires any standard configurations, all those are set here. Yes. First one, once you enable only here, then it will activate to the respective company. If you have 10 companies, you'll have to activate for 10 companies. This Then only this module will enable to the all 10 companies. Once you press yes here, there is a uh, standard configurations. Number one, you will have to uh, set up a voucher type. Once you import this, uh, all transactions will go to this uh, respective voucher. Here I'm just selecting purchase voucher. There are two, but I'm selecting. Can you uh, create a voucher type called uh, JSON import under purchase and we'll use that voucher type? Yeah, sure, sir. So that we know uh, it can be, anything can be custom. Yes, an important. Yeah, under purchases. Okay, again, I'm just going to help. Add on features. Here, just an import voucher also is there. You can select that. Then for round up. Suppose if there is any minor prices or if there are less than 50 paisa, you can uh, use this ledger for uh, 
rounding of that one. Okay, there is no ledger. We'll create that one. Okay, before that, okay, anyhow, I'll leave this. There is no not applicable. Okay, I'm just putting cash only, time being. There are some stand, okay, anyhow, I'll, I'm, I'll create that one. I don't want to confuse. No, no. Yeah, go and create the ledger. Yeah. Use round of ledger here for round up. Then there are percentages as you know 0%, 5%, 12 percentage, 18, 28. For this, each percentage will have to configure here for local expenditure ledger, interstate expenditure ledger against to that CGST, SGST, IGST is. Same for 5 percentage, 12 percentage, 18 percentage, and 28 percentage. This is what I shown in ledger version. This is already I created the duties and taxes and standard ledgers. I tell you why why this is required. Then yeah, as we answer is uh, Babu, I want to add, it yeah. is not mandatory for you to have these many ledgers. You can have called one purchase for yes. local and interested for CGST as one CGST input, IGST input, IGST input. You can have one. It depends on your choice. It's not mandatory that you need to have so much. You are creating one default where it has to be rooted. Yes. This also I'll tell you, this is just only standard where it will help. As Venusar has said, all expense ledgers will be dynamically created, dynamically configured each vendor wise that will take automatically by, suppose if that is not there, suppose you want to ignore that, you want to take this ledgers, that time this will help. That I'll show you in maybe when we are creating transaction, how this will help. This is the primary setup as Venusar said, if you want to create separate ledgers, you can create, otherwise you can use direct. Uh, one ledger only purchase expenses or some expense ledgers or G input CGST, SGST, IGST. You can configure for all the percentages. Yeah. Uh, Babu, I think uh, the, there are a lot of uh, loose ends that needs to be just switched. By the way, this has been created only for the session. We yeah. can. Uh, Yeah, this is all set. Yeah, this is set. Those open parts just need to be closed. by. Yes. Then once you enable and configure that, you can able to see uh, one menu, new menu, purchase import JSON B2B from utility section. Which yes, is there are... not there in your standard tally. Go back, gateway of the tally. You will not find in the utilities, you will only find banking. Now, along with the banking, you are now seeing additional button called purchase import JSON. Yes. Yeah. Here, there are multiple steps. There are four steps. There is no multiple. There are four steps. Number one, you can check and create vendors. Number two, you can import your expense ledgers. Number three, you can configure your expense ledgers against vendors. Then you can import. But I'll show you one by one. First, we'll create vendors yeah, here the jsons are there i'm just copied here in this location i'm just copying this path just to this path only just observe it if you have any questions you let me know here you can able to import all uh, months of jsons or you can import only april month i'm just importing only april month Yeah, it's created. Almost 51 ledgers is created. You can see in calculator panel, we are just printing, creating ledgers 51. Once this is done, second thing, expense ledgers. Then we'll have to create some expense ledgers. For this, I given already sample template here. If you click that, automatically a sample template will come. I have already some sample expense ledges. See here, I'm just having around 33 expense ledges. I'm just copying this to this template. Just to go to this place and go. 
path. It will come automatically from sheet one only. We didn't uh, change anything. Few groups not exist. Okay, we'll see. This is also one benefit. Maybe we are not creating groups. Here, this group is not there in tally. Just we'll go and create manually this group. Yes. Now we'll try to create. We'll try to import. Any other groups? No, only one group. In fact, down you can see in the calculator panel what's happening. Ledger has been created with the GST number, everything. Yes, yes. expense ledger is also imported. We'll see. Oh, red just view. See, now there are vendors and also expense ledgers. So here, office expenses. The purchases. So, so many now expenditures vendors got created. Can you just open any one vendor? Sure, sir. Yeah. Yeah, if you see the GST, go to their GST number. Yeah. You can see the GST number also got created. And exactly whatever which is there in the portal that got created. In fact, in one of our earlier thing, we have shown by entering the GST number, how to auto populate all the details of the party address and various information. So there is another TDL okay, that can be done. Now the masters got created. Go back to the steps now. Yes. So step one, we have checked and created the vendors. We have imported the expense ledgers. On top of it, you still want to set up something manually, which is incremental. You will be doing now against each vendor. Go ahead in the step three. Yes. This is office maintenance. This is a one-time activity yes. you will have to do because you know which vendor belongs to where. So, and every time when a new vendor come and you are seeing these entries are going to unknown purchases or some, something, it can also be uh, categorized into any, any ledger, any values going into that, you can account it. Babu? In right side, sorry. Later, uh, only unclassified vendors you can bring in instead of all. Yeah, sure, sir. Yeah. Here I'm displaying groups also. You can select group base. Okay, I'm just uh, giving uh, 11 uh, parties. Repairs and maintenance. Yeah. I just filled 12 vendors, rest of, uh, rest of vendors, almost 51 vendors are there, but out of 51, only 12 I uh, mapped expense ledgers. Rest, it will take uh, that configurations which I configured initially that based on that percentage that we'll take from that, we'll see that differences. Yeah, now first uh, step one, we checked and created vendor. Step two, we imported expense ledgers. Step three, we mapped against vendor expenses for 12 vendors. Rest we didn't map. We'll see what will happen for others also. The final step, importing of JSON. See here also you can import multiple or you can select only one. Here also I'm just selecting. Yeah, one only. Yeah, so if you have 12 months data, put it into a folder, select all items, it will do item by item automatically. Or yes. you select month over month, it will be selecting each month. Now, as the system is processing, you can see below uh, each entry by entry, like supplier, ABC, voucher number, the purchase value, it is showing in that way. And on the top, you can see the percentage, which is uh, going 25%, it is done. 
So the system now has an ability to size the whole of the volume and it will automatically say how much time it is going to take in doing the transaction. So all those are kind of into automated. Above one thing which we forgot to do, I think yeah. we'll do for the, uh, we'll import the May again by changing okay. our GST number. Sure, sir. Okay. We are doing data to a correct GST number or not. Sure. In the current scenario, uh, the data is getting imported. Okay. But we haven't shown you the validation. We will show you the validation also in a while. So, Babu, we will do the May month by changing the GST number and uh, which where the uh, statistics is same. After you change the GST number, how much the statistics is going up? We will do that. Sure, sir. Yeah. So you can automatically see all the uh, different different vendors, different uh, things that are coming up. Yes. And uh, I think how many entries are there? Hundred, two hundred are there? More than thousand, sir. There are more than thousand. more than thousand entries, and uh, it's kind of a minute. It's a minute, yeah. Can you go to statistics one? Yes. Thousand four hundred entries. Thousand four hundred entries. Can you see this have happened in like in a glimpse? Now can let's go to P and L and see that. So I think which period? Twenty two twenty. Yeah. So you can see the entire entries have come. Alt F one. Yeah, insurance, machine repair, everything has come. Can you just go to one machine repair? Yeah. So look at this. Supplier invoice number is there. Supplier date, invoice date is there, which is coming from the invoice and everything. We, yeah. we have put it to machine service. It has gone exactly to the machine service. And uh, CGST, SGST has happened. Here comes the round off. That is where Babu has uh, specifically chosen round off basis, the value which is there in the portal so that you know the proper accounting that is happening. And even in the narration, it's saying purchase from electro blah, blah controls, invoice number, invoice date, and the invoice value, the total value, which is down that is given for your reference to show that, okay, what is what is it happening? You can change it from wherever, uh, whichever the thing you want. You want to change, instead of machine repairs, you can put it as office maintenance. It's like it's now that it is in your control, you can make yes. this. Yes, vendor-wise you can map, there is an option, user can change anytime. That is beautiful, sir. Here also it will come. If they configured percentage wise, that will come percentage wise. Otherwise, that will come as a single ledger, the tax ledger also. The most recommendable thing use only CGST, input CGST, SGST, IGST. No need to create percentages wise. Sir. Yeah. Now I'll show you control point of view whether it will import to the exact company or a different company. Okay, before going to that, is there any questions? Yeah, there's a question on where will we get add on. So, Joji Joe, sir, uh, this is a paid tool. Uh, the cost of this tool is 6,500 and uh, you can reach to Stephen. Uh, he will be providing you. Next question, is it possible to import 2A? Perfectly possible. You can either go 2A method or 2B method, whatever is your thing. There are two different TDLs. One TDL is separately for 2A, one TDL is for 2B. We didn't want to mix because uh, when you import, it will become like a duplicate kind of uh, transaction. You can choose to go either of it. Yes. Yes. Now I'll go to that JSON file. There I have August, within the August. The GST number is, is the GST number, but I'll change. 
alter feature secure okay here instead of so we'll make it as one yeah now we'll try to import for august see no records it is showing no records so this is a control to ensure that you people unintentionally mistakes don't happen now after importing tracing which wrong data that got imported is mm -hmm. controlled so now go back to the company no no features f11 yeah One yes. Shall I import? Yeah. Earlier, 1,400 vouchers were there, right? Correct. Hmm. I think another 1,000 vouchers will get added. Here, uh, okay, control panel will be keep going. The differential vendors who are not there, a new vendors who have come, they will also automatically get created. If you think that, uh, what about new vendors that were not there, that gets created by the system automatically. You don't need to be worried that uh, will there be some errors. And yes, all those unmapped entries are parked into purchase ledger. Instead of purchase ledger for your own control, you want to mark it into some... Uh, miscellaneous uh, purchases, suspense purchases, where you want to check and classify, you can do that. So you can define where, what you want to post where is completely in your control. Yes. Yeah, when it is creating vendor also, there we are updating maximum information, mandatory information around group, then bill, most of the uh, important points. Uh, maintain bill by bill. That is also we are enabling. Second thing we are updating based on state code, state and country, then GST number, GST registration types. Maximum information we are updating other than address and contact details. That maybe we will have to update manually. Always you follow the steps. If you follow the steps, then automatically you can uh, set up that uh, expense ledgers also. If you miss that uh, steps, then again, it will post to the defaults. It just, again, you need to rework on it. Yeah, That's it's all. always recommended that you map or you know the vendor. Very unlikely that one vendor is giving you service and it is there into two ledgers. Otherwise, you know, so it's like when Gopal is providing audit or accounting or professional charges or legal charges or telephone charges. You know, by vendor, the expenditure name is more or less known. So that yeah. you do the mapping. Yes. Yes, now it's 2,888 records. See, yeah. in April. In August, you can see 1,485. You yes. might be wondering, while I was posting August, how July has come, we have imported 2B. Yes. In to be any one vendor would have filed their July return late that has come into this. But what we make sure, whatever is the invoice date, we post it back to that period invoice date. We don't post it to the date of August, it goes to the respective date of July. Go back to PNL. Yes. Now you can see this expenditure line items did not get increased. It is the same. You add some more ma uh, mapping expenditure, some more would have come. Yes. Whatever you have not mapped, we only mapped, he only mapped 12. Whatever has not been mapped, all that are been parked under the purchases, which is that 5 crore 64 that you are seeing, it is parked into that GL ledgers. Okay. Yes. Any questions to anyone? Yeah, any questions? Uh, Joe sir is asking importing of sales. 
yeah importing of sales can also happen but uh, technically sales is, should always happen from origination document we don't believe posting gstr1 as a sales because you have already entered so there is a, some source data for sales we should integrate if you have a pause system or whatever be the system uh, our team can help in integrating the data traveling from that source to tally automatically yes is yes. it possible in tally prime 5.0 i think you are seeing tally prime 5.0 yes already we are showing demo in 5.0 only and it is not just 5.0 it will applicable in tally erp9 also uh, with a little some tweaking even it to in that also it's possible yeah it will work for tally erp9 also yes perfect any other questions to anyone Thank you, Vijay Kumar, sir. A uh, little gray area, but yes. But I want you to experience that the if uh, thousand entries have to be posted, it's a job of two people working whole month. But the two people whole month is replaced by two minutes. That is the era of technology that we are living in. We have to use machines for machine compute power. We human beings have the intellect. So our mind should be used in doing the analysis and more better work. And the mundane process work has to be done by the system. So two man months job has become two minutes. Now people always ask this question that will AI and ML comes and will it replace my, will my job go off? Answer is yes, if you don't appreciate it. If you appreciate it, if you are using it, that means you are raising above the machines. You are controlling it. That is why chat GPT and all call as assistant. If you are making them as your assistant, you will work. If you are thinking that they are boss, they are great, and you are keeping them above you, of course, your job will become uh, redundant. So how you are seeing them and how you are using them matters the most. And what we have seen is like this surfacing uh, tip of an iceberg, what things could be possible. Uh, Joji sir is asking about the possibility of inventory. Uh, sir, I would say at this point, the possibility of inventory is not possible because we are doing the transaction posting from GSTR 2B. It is not from the e-invoice raw file. Uh, government has GSTN has been working off late for making the e invoice data available invoice to invoice. Once the e invoice JSON comes, then you can post it with inventory also. Once the e invoice comes, uh, we have looked into the API documentation of IMS. Even your IMS will not be coming with inventory. Hence, this module will be without inventory. It is just a transaction integration at the transaction level, which is voucher level, finance module. Yeah. Any other questions to anyone? Perfect. And I don't believe in overnight enrichment of the knowledge. Every session, we create a small one or the two tool tips, Excel tips, which we believe and I believe that you should be specializing it you should be using it and it will promote you in your work that you are doing you will find a great happiness about yourself the way you are working uh, it's like it always tells it uh, takes a toll on me to tell babu go slow go slow it's like you know you are doing is like others might not know i'm sure in some of the steps is like you you are seeing in one screen Suddenly, different screen got opened. You didn't know like how it has happened. Like you, uh, you, his, I asked, can you just go to the statistics? He would have just pressed DSS. Like he knows that that is there. Suddenly, 
from gateway of menu statistics menu would have uh, got open right so but that's how you will be it's like you will be with a huge speed when you are using the technology yeah and uh, vijay kumar sir uh, you need another class don't worry this session is being recorded you will be getting a copy of the recording only all the registered people will be getting a copy of the recording of the session you can watch it at a later point in time the cost of the tool is very nominal 6500 rupees and imagine the quantum of the time that is getting saved for you is uh, humongous you can always reach to us uh, our team will set it up and install and do a demo once again whenever you need yeah with this note we have come to end of the tech session today we are going closing lit early good for all of us yes babu anything you have to add yeah this is good session sir this will help lot to users maybe every session we are adding one new thing to users is yeah. a good education to all the our clients and users who are all uh, our participants sir is really good initiation we are continuously adding the tech session yes yeah and uh, if forget about other my power query knowledge as substantially has gone up after these sessions i'm not sure how many of you are using power query in day to day if not please start up please start using power query it is it is really the powerhouse and uh, yes. you will be able to process many things in a much faster way uh, joji sir is using and i'm sure you will be uh, experiencing the advantage of being a power user over the others yes done with this note we come to end of the session uh, each of you will get an email of the feedback form uh, as you fill the feedback you will get a link to download our presentation material and uh, uh, you will also get the link for letting us know what next sessions to be there and a copy of today's session thank you everyone and have a great day thank you sir thank you for giving great opportunity to present at next session Yes. Thank you. Sir. Hoping to see you again.